This is the sacred hoop. Then I was standing on the highest mountain of them all. And the ground beneath me was the whole hoop of the world. And while I stood there, I saw more than I could tell. And I understood more than I saw. For I was seeing in the sacred manner the shape of all things of the Spirit. And the shapes as they were split together by one being. And I saw that the sacred hoop of my people was one of many hoops that made one circle, wide as daylight and starlight. And in the center grew one mighty flowering tree to shelter all the children of one mother and one father. And I saw that it was holy. Okay? Because at the same time, I came across a book that was called One Plus One Equals One. 
and it talks about the evolution of our cellular biology, and that without the creation of mitochondria within our DNA, the combination of mitochondria within our DNA, and separately, the combination of chlorophyll within plant DNA, we would not be multicellular organisms. And that mitochondria and cytoplasm are separate RNA DNA factors from the DNA that's in our nuclei. The nuclei is a separate thing. So within our cells are two completely individual protein strands that evolved together so that we can be a united body as one. Well. That concept I think is very, very cool. And what I thought was really cool was after listening to that TV show, in which I got to the end of the season, and he's busted the bad guys, and he figured out who put him in prison and why they put him in prison. He comes to the final realization, his enlightenment at the end of the series is one plus one equals one. The quote that he uses, and I have burned hours of daylight and moonlight trying to find where this quote originally came from, and it keeps pointing me back to that stupid TV show, <laughs> which is the reason why I'm using it as my reference. <laughs> but the quote is, when we were children, we were taught one plus one equals two. But in reality, one plus one equals one. That, in Zen, is how we define love. The one plus one equals one is an affirmation of love. Now, on a cellular biological level, it is hard to use love as the binding principle in that one plus one union. But from what I read in the text, in the text, one plus one equals one, it is by John Attenborough. No, Ooh, I wrote it down. But John Archibald. How could I forget Archibald? John Archibald wrote the book. And John Archibald's basic premise for the entire text is that without the side-by-side -side evolution of those two bits of DNA within a single cell, we would not have been able to make multicellular organisms. Without multicellular organisms, we wouldn't be here. And so the way that that developed was simultaneously side by side as one whole unit. The one, the cytoplasm, the, the mitochondria or the chlorophyll, which is the power factory of the cell, developed within the cell separately from the nuclei, which has the DNA of the individual organism. So when we marry and we make children and we move forward, or animals made and they make offspring, that's the nuclei of DNA that is forming and growing and moving forward. Separately, the mitochondria and the cytoplasm have grown and moved forward. And that movement forward has created a wide diversity within those cells, a wide diversity that um, is postulated within another book that I read, Survival of the Beautiful, a look at art, science, and evolution. Um, Survival of the Beautiful puts forth that if we are a created group, then there's an awful lot of extra unuseful stuff that was created for no apparent reason. If we are an evolved group, then through evolution, we have evolved to be attracted to beauty, symmetry. We've been evolved to be attracted to uh, not just the opposite sex, but the attraction and the simplicity of the opposite sex. And he uses throughout his text, the very first example in Survival of the Beautiful, is he makes a reference to power birds. And I don't know how much you guys know about power birds. If you want to learn more about power birds, you can watch Life of Birds with uh, Rowan Atkinson. Uh, episode 7 talks about mating. The Not power bird is one of the... What's that? David Attenborough? David Attenborough. Did I get it wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I was looking at my notes. David Attenborough. Okay. So, when he talks about mating, he talks about the power bird, the golden power bird in Australia as well. There's a couple other power birds that are the only animals within the bird kingdom that use artwork to attract a mate. It's not about their plumage, it's not about their song, it's not how well they dance with their feathers. The male bower bird creates, I'm going to use illustrations today, <laughs> he creates a wicker bower that's big enough to have a pole in the middle and a large area of space in which he fills with flowers and shiny bug pelts and rocks and amber, gold. The book talks about this gentleman who's walking along and he looks over and he's like, oh, I can't believe this. 
There are two plastic spoons out here in the middle of this <laughs> pristine natural environment. What horrible person tossed these two plastic spoons here? And the guy he's walking with is like, oh no, look right behind it. You see the battle. The reason the two plastic spoons are there is because the bower bird attracts a mate by creating the most attractive artistic display possible. He goes out and he picks flowers, and he picks petals, and he picks bug shells, and he picks fruits and seeds and foods to show what a fantastic guy he is. And then he doesn't just like flop them on the ground. He very, very carefully, meticulously puts them out in patterns and lays them out so that when the female birds walk by, they can walk through his bower and go, ah, oh, this is pretty nice, and bob up the streets and everybody. <laughs> so these very specific golden-breasted bower birds in Australia like the color blue. And they will fly tens of miles to find blue, including stealing plastic spoons from picnic sites. <laughs> so these were not spoons that were thrown on the ground by some irreverent traveler. These were spoons that our bird went out to find so that he could show up Bob. <laughs> right? The artistic presence that's created here. All right, so anyway, when we start thinking about one plus one equals one, we can think of it in a couple different ways. We can think of it in the story that I taught the kids. One raindrop plus one raindrop equals one big raindrop, right? We as people kind of work that way. When we get married, we go from one individual and one individual to come together to be a joint individual. Theoretically, the perfect marriage, which I've yet to discover. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I'm not my wife, but I've met a lot of people who are married, but the perfect one is still, still I think, a figment of our imaginations. <laughs> is a blending of two people into one entity. That's kind of the reason we end up with one last name or one elongated last name. You don't have to take the man's last name. You can blend your last names, right? We can have the hyphens involved. It's okay. But the blending of that family, that two people, the one person, one person coming together to make one family, that makes one offspring or one more offspring or one more offspring creates one larger family. That one larger family becomes one larger kinship, that one larger kinship evolves into one township, one township, one society, one society, one... Okay. I know it seems like I'm really simplifying the Zen concept. The Zen concept in general is to simplify down to nothing. So we are no longer thinking individuals, we are acting individuals. The Zen principle of one plus one comes from the idea of a teacher teaching a student. The teacher teaches the student his Zen philosophy. The student doesn't parrot the teacher's Zen philosophy. The student then becomes a part of the whole concept of Zen. There are many, many references to a wide variety of Zen books that I went through this last week that basically say you cannot teach Zen verbally. You have to experience it. The Zen concept, the idea when you see them with like uh, the rocks and the sand that has been carefully manicured garden, is this reduction of things to bring out the essence of the simple. So when we reduce our lives down to the one plus one equals one, we reduce the very, sim the very broadest of messages down to one simple identity. We are one identity. The first one is I, the second one is you, the third one is we. <coughs> it even makes it up. Okay. So when we work together in evolution, it's a different change. This is what I found really exciting about reading the evolution books, because I know a little bit about Darwin's theory of evolution, and initially we talked about survival of the fittest, but then he went on to the rise of man, is that correct? The sin of man. The sin of man, okay? In which he postulated that there's a lot more choice involved in our spousal relationships to breed, beyond just the need to have the strongest, biggest, hardiest of whatever that other person is. The difference there is very important because it brings in the aesthetic, the aesthetic of simplicity. So, once again, we go back to the survival of beauty, and the survival of beauty, we find that the plumage of the peacock is beautiful, glorious plumage. Plumage that was chosen by the females because they found more than just a male who could bring them the most food for their offspring, Somehow they found the, the, the tail feathers aesthetically pleasing, and the more glorious those tail feathers became, the more pleasing. But the glory of those tail, tail feathers were uniform across the entire breed of that bird. It wasn't like they thought this peacock in the blue, orange, and yellow looked great, but this one over here in the red, green, and purple would be okay too. No, they're all the same color. 
They're all the same general pattern. It is the expression of that pattern, who can get the biggest, the strongest, the best, within that breed of bird. So, you go to a different breed of bird, they have different plumage, they have different bowers that they create for their loved ones. The bower that attracts brings in the spouse. The spouse isn't always the strongest, the fittest, the one most wonderful. And the way that the book describes it, I thought was very interesting. Because if we are choosing for the most strong and likely to survive, we would have very few species. <laughs> Well, we have a lot of species that are good enough to survive. And they're good enough to survive because they're an attractive flatter, because they're an attractive bird, because they're an attractive animal, and they're attractive because of their patterns and their, their markings, right? But then he goes on to say that those patterns and markings are beyond just attraction. They're also camouflaged for survival. So when you look at the mallard duck, who has the beautiful green head and the white collar and then the tan underbelly and the dark top, you might think that they kind of stand out if you hold them up against the white piece of paper. They don't camouflage very well. You put that same bird on water, in which he's now reflecting the light that reflects off the water. It becomes an abstract recreation of the duck on the pond that blends into that surrounding. So not only is there beauty, but the simplicity also makes its nature able to survive longer because of that. There's a fantastic painting of a peacock in the Smithsonian, and the peacocks, it's called Peacock and Wood. Um, it's a peacock with its tail down, and it's just walking through a um, grassy knoll kind of situation with light coming through. And it's very difficult to see the peacock. And the, concept, the, the idea that's putting forward is that not only is there beauty in the peacock, but the beauty also turns into camouflage, and that camouflage is just as relevant. It's hard to believe that it would be difficult to see a peacock, but you see that picture, portrait of a peacock in wood, and you have a hard time finding the whole body of the peacock. The peacock disappears into that lush undergrowth. It's a very lovely painting, a very good representation of one plus one equals one. The bird then becomes one with the wood. The simplicity of the two come together to be one whole. So, how are we a whole? How does evolution and sin work together in this? I was really frustrated, as I said earlier, that I could not find the original quote for one plus one equals one. And it's because there are an awful lot of holy texts that reflect that very specific idea. You can look at 1 Corinthians, now I have to check all my notes. 1 Corinthians 6, 17, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. It is a use throughout Christian <clears throat> doctrine today. The one plus one equals one. We are one with Christ, we are one together in Christ. If you look at the Hindu sacred text, oh man, I guess it's wrong. What is it? That we don't get it. Thank you. Say it out loud, Ken. Bhagavad Gita. I want to say it's verse 86. In that area, it talks about the oneness with God and the oneness of self. One and one and one, we are one in the universe. Um, we also have it in the Muslim tradition. It's also in the Judaic tradition. It's also in uh, the Zen Buddhist tradition. It's also in the, um, the idea of Confucianism, even, if you look at the concept of Society in which we are one society and we are one society together and we work with rules and those rules help us work function as a whole together. All those different varieties of one plus one equals one boil down to the same thing, that we are a growing entity that is dependent on each other, but as a whole we are individual. We are, oh gosh, sorry, I should have written this down for the easier, right? Okay. And one plus one plus one we are whole together. The size expounds without the number getting larger. So we're not a mob, we're a crowd. Okay, the difference being semantic, I understand. But as we grow together, as we expand in number, we are still one united. We're still one whole, and we're one whole in evolution. And that's what I thought was really interesting to ties it all back again to the beginning. That if we are, as cells, combining together to be one determined cell that can then join with other cells to become one entity, then we can also look at ourselves individually on the planet as beings, as one cell, combining together to make one entity. We can look at our individual selves as all having one job within that entity. That job is to perfect our own beauty, our own growth. In the perfection of our beauty and growth, we edify, no, we get our ticket for being on the next, on the next step forward in evolution, right? 
Because if evolution is survival of not just the fittest, but also the beautiful, we define beauty as more than just this appearance that is stuck to our skull, but, you know, the architects, the artists, the musicians, the doctors, the thinkers, the people that are growing us, right? I got really close to not doing an entire sermon on 1 plus 1 equals 1 because I read a book that uh, Kurt gave me called by, by uh, Rick Matt, Matten? Where you get Kurt? Rick Matten? Is that right? He's a, he passed away in the early 21st century. He's an artist who was the first UUA minister to be made a minister who didn't graduate college and didn't go to university. He's the poet laureate for the Unitarian Universalist Association from 1967 to 75 or 78. And his artwork slash poetry was a spoken word poetry in which his artwork was one single line that he would create an entire image with one line. So he took one line and added it to one poem to create one vision. Okay? And when we start thinking about the combination of ones and the expansion of that, I really want to just stand up there and draw all day. <laughs> <laughs> and I miss it, and you're going to get a sermon about drawing in the future. But today, I just wanted us to remember that not only is this a metaphysic, metaphysical uh, meditation equation, but this is also something that actually happens within nature and within the development of species that we look and see all around us. That without that ability for one plus one to equal one in science, that we wouldn't even be here to sit down and contemplate one plus one as an existential problem. There would be just a whole bunch of bacteria everywhere. <laughs> Single-celled organisms filling oceans and covering land. It'd be, that's not it. There would be no more because they couldn't get along well enough to become one larger entity. So I leave you with that idea that even on a physical level as we are now, your individual shells in your brain don't hold one thought for you. Okay? There's no doctor in the world that can point to the cell in your brain that makes you remember when you had your first I don't know, kiss or had that first taste of your favorite, favorite food. It's all those cells working together to be one mind that gives you the opportunity to have memory. It's the way that the electricity passes through the variety of cells that come together to give you your one story. And your one story combined with everyone else's story makes the group story, the whole story, right? And that whole story gives us an opportunity to move together in the whole world. I'll leave you with that. Now. So now, I know my endings are always going to work. <laughs>